Beloved in Christ, the Lord be with you. I welcome you to my reflection for the first Sunday of Advent, ye be. And the theme of my reflection is the power of a holy expectation. Our readings are taken from the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 63, from verses 16 to 17. And from chapter 64, verse 1, and from verse 3 to 8. Our second reading is from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, from verses 3 to 9. And the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 13, from verses 33 to 37. Beloved in Christ, today marks the beginning of the liturgical period of Advent, and the beginning of a new liturgical year. The word Advent is from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming, and it is a translation from the Greek word parousia. Therefore, it connotes expectancy and hope, and at the same time points to the second coming of Christ. Hence, in our context, the time of Advent is a time of great expectation for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ amongst men. Unlike in the ancient Greece, it meant the coming of their God. But for us, it is the coming of our great God. The coming of Jesus can be understood, therefore, in three different senses. First, is his coming more than 2,000 years ago. That is, his incarnation, that which inaugurated the messianic time of salvation. Second, is his final and glorious coming at the end of time, the parousia. And third, is that between his first coming and the final coming, that is the intermediary advent, his imminent and continuous coming into our lives. The Christian life, therefore, is an ongoing advent, a constant personal encounter with Jesus, who has come, who is to come, and who is already in our midst. In the Advent spirituality, Christ is always the one who is to come, the one who is always expected. Advent, therefore, is not just a remembrance of a historical figure linked to a particular time and geographical location. It is not even an anticipated vision of the coming of the just judge. Rather, the spirituality of Advent draws our attention to the urgency for the Lord to come into our lives, with his grace and message of salvation. For Christ is the living Lord, il veniente, the one who comes. Be that as it may, we may begin our reflection with some fundamental questions. First, between the first and the final coming, what sense has this our advent? Second, if Christ is the one who always has to come, what then should be our attitude in view of his coming? In that bid, the readings of today are furnished with some insights and responses. The first reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah brings us face to face with a God who is a father and with the reality of our own sinfulness before him. Isaiah is one of the Advent prophets because he lived at a time of great longing for the coming of the Messiah and the restoration of God's people. He presents a time when the Ezites have returned from Babylon and inspired by the death row Isaiah's prophecies, they had high hopes. But concretely, they discovered that nothing seemed to happen. The awaited restoration was not forthcoming. The people have begun to recognize that their exile was a consequence of their failure to live with integrity and in the ways of the Lord. Be that as it may, they burst into a lament of their situation. Yahweh, can you restrain yourself at all? Will you stay silent and afflict us beyond endurance, as we see in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 11? In the midst of all this reality that is still plunging them into despair, the prophet cried out to God for divine intervention. Oh, that you would come down. In your presence, the mountains would quake as we see in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 2. As a matter of fact, at the heart of the spirituality of Advent 
is the human cry for divine intervention and manifestation. He acknowledges Israel's sinfulness and their need for the potter's hand to refashion them into a faithful people they were meant to be. He uses the imagery of the potter and the clay, a significant reminder that we are in the hands of a God who loves us, our Father and our Redeemer. As we see in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 64, we need this constant reminder that we are like clay in the divine potter's hand, which goes a long way to revealing who and what we are before God, creatures, pardoned, and redeemed sinners. Truly, Advent reminds us and brings to our consciousness the fatherhood of God and the sonship, of course, of our Lord Jesus Christ, Iveniente, the one who is to come. The prophetic prayer of Isaiah in verse 1 is powerful, praying for God in his might to tear the heaven and come down. This prayerful call for divine manifestation alludes or is connected with the mark and account of the baptism of Jesus in Mark chapter 1 verse 10, when the heavens were opened and God spoke. Indeed, the opening up of heaven is a mark of a great divine intervention and manifestation, and without doubt, that was what Isaiah was asking for. In the spirituality of Advent, heaven is open for the earth. God opened heaven and sent his beloved son. Behold, it is indeed plausible to launch us into the period of Advent with this divine invocation of open heaven. And the Advent cry, O oh, that thou should rend the heaven and come down. And two, the invocation to God to return, as we see in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 17, is typical of Advent spirituality. The Gospel passage recounts the parable of the doorkeeper. Therein, Jesus announces to us the word at the heart of Advent. Watch. He says, take heed and watch. It is an attention of not only the mind, but the heart and the whole life. There is a danger of being asleep. The problem for some of us is not just to watch, but to wake up, because we are sleeping Christians. Little wonder St. Paul wants, Brothers, it is time to wake from sleep, as we see in Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Mark's account of this parable has some particular features, especially in comparison with the Luke account. When we go to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 12, from verses 35 to 38, some of the particularities of Mark includes the phrase, a man going on a journey, which was taken from the parable of the talent. Put his servants in charge, each with his work, taken from the parable of the faithful and unfaithful servants, as in Matthew chapter 24, verse 45, and Luke chapter 12, verse 42. The parable then ends with an exhortation, Watch then, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the first or the second, or even the third watch. The passage begins with the imperative, be on your guard, stay awake, and stay awake again. No one can calculate the precise chaotical moment, the kairos, of the coming of the Lord. As such, from here springs the necessity for all to be awake for the eschatological moment that will mark the end of the world and the parousia of the glorious Christ. In that case, the time that is to come determines the reality of the present moment. In the context of the parable, the similitude therein is referred to the eschatological event of the parousia, which represents the full realization of the kingdom. The servants that we are given power designate the disciples of Jesus. Here, why Mark speaks of the departure of the master who traveled abroad. Luke speaks of a nuptial banquet. In Mark's account, one discovers that in verse 35 is replete with significance, for the master of the house is the glorious Christ. The four chronological indications, evening, midnight, cock crew, or down, indicate the four broad division of the night 
in the Roman counting from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. In the last verse, in verse 37, we see how the teaching of Jesus Christ that was addressed to the four disciples is now addressed to all the Christian community and to us today, of course. What I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. In this passage, therefore, the imperative reminder, stay awake, is very much expressive, for it condenses the essential meaning of the Macana eschatological discourse. As essentially, all our Christian life consists and is geared towards a vigilant wait for the coming of the Lord, which is certain because it is founded on the unwavering words of the Lord, faith on the resurrection and on the different apparitions of Christ. Above all this, beloved in Christ, we are called to be sentries in view of the return of the Son of Man. Most importantly, let us hearken to, the, to appropriate the threefold guidelines of Jesus to us. Take heed, watch, pray. We need to activate the Advent mood and attitude. As we await the Savior who comes, it behoves us to reaffirm that our expectation is not like that of the people of Old Testament because it is not only an expectation, but it is also memorial and presence. It is a memorial because the one we are waiting has already come. This we remember at Christmas. It is presence because he is with us. His word we have heard is himself with us. The Eucharist we celebrate is himself with us. Interestingly, the most beautiful image of the Christian Advent is that of walking with joy to meet the one who is walking with us, who walks at our side. As suggestive of the theme of our reflection today, the time of Advent is not a time to wallow in idleness or to wait in inertia. Rather, the itinerary is waiting and walking. It comports a good dose of preparedness for the coming and the presence of the Lord. In Advent, the search for God changes into the expectation of God. We live in anticipation of Him, and as we expect His coming into our lives, may we put our voices together to that of St. John in saying, The one who attests this thing says, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus as in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. Come, Jesus, for we are in need of you. Come and dissipate the darkness shrouding our world. Happy Advent season, beloved in Christ. And may the mighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.